Psalm 25 is a psalm that talks a lot about hearing God's voice and perhaps the barriers to hearing God's voice. So as we talk through it today, I pray that God continues to reveal things in your life that might be barriers to your relationship with him. I pray this episode blesses you. Hey friends, welcome to the Hearing Jesus podcast. Do you sometimes doubt if you're truly hearing God's voice or if it's really your own? And how do you know the difference? Do you ever struggle to feel confident in your relationship with God and what he says in his word? Do you sometimes feel stagnant or like maybe you hit a wall in your spiritual life? Hey, I'm your host, Rachel Grohl, missionary, author, pastor, and life coach. And I have been there. I too was doubting God's voice in my own life. I felt insecure about my relationship with him and I wanted to be obedient to what God was calling me to do, but I wasn't quite sure how to figure out what that was. I felt like I was wasting time trying to figure it out, and I just wanted a way to understand His will for my life. The answer for me was found in the pages of the scriptures, as I learned how to understand what they were actually saying. If you're ready to grow in your faith and to step confidently into the calling God has for you, then join me as we dig deep into God's Word so that you can learn to live out your faith in your everyday life. Hey friends, before we get into today's episode, I have a quick word. I know that you have been frustrated with being confident in how to tell the difference between hearing from God and wondering if it's your own voice. I know, I've been there myself. That's why I wrote the Bible study, She Hears, Learning to Listen to Jesus. This is a six-week study that takes you through the book of John, looking at six women in the life of Jesus, how he calls them, how he encourages them, how he equips them. It also teaches the color method of Bible study, helping you to learn how to really understand the scriptures. I also include a lot of cultural and historical information that makes these familiar passages of scripture really come alive. This is a great study to do with maybe your teen girls or a group of friends from church, and it will really help you gain confidence in how to hear from the Lord and set you up with some tools that will stay with you long after the study is over. Again, head to shehears.org and you can find the Bible study on the resources page. Hey friends, welcome back to the Hearing Jesus podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Grohl, and today we are doing a devotional reading of Psalm 25. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. In you I trust, O my God. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame, but they will be put to shame who are treacherous without excuse. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Remember, O Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from old. Remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you are good, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful for those who keep the demands of his covenant. For the sake of your name, O Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. Who then is the man that fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way chosen for him. He will spend his days in prosperity and his descendants will inherit the land. The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. My eyes are ever on the Lord, for he will release my feet from the snare. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart have multiplied. Free me from my anguish. Look upon my affliction in my distress and take away all my sins. See how my enemies have increased and how fiercely they hate me. Guard my life and rescue me. Let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness protect me, because my hope is in you. Redeem Israel, O God, from all of my troubles. So Psalm 25, this is a Psalm of David, and there's some things that I think will be really helpful as we go through and understand some of the underlying culture and history things that we might miss if we're not familiar with this this time period. This is one of, Psalm 25 is one of the acrostic Psalms, and acrostic just means it goes through alphabetically, each phrase starts with 
the letter from the Hebrew alphabet. And the reason why they wrote those a lot of times was to help with memorization. Uh, it's not like it is now where we just go and refer to it and open up our Bible and, you know, look it up when we need to. In, in fact, at that time period, and even up until the time of Jesus, a lot of people in that culture would be memorizing a lot of these Psalms or different portions of the Torah. And so the acrostic was really a tool that would help people to remember different aspects of um, certain key hymns or Psalms. And so um, I think that's important. It, it helps us understand that there is value in memorizing or at the very least being familiar and meditating on God's word. Verse two, I want to read. It says, in you, I trust, oh my God, do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. In the ancient world, um, this idea of being put to shame was a common expression and it really summed up the emotion of defeat that was shame. Shame in that culture is a lot different if you're from the United States or, or a Western uh, culture. It's, it's a lot different than the way shame would be understood in other cultures. And so while we understand in, in the United States uh, we're more of a guilt-based cu culture, like a... Let me try to explain this in terms that I think will be easy to understand. There's different kinds of lenses that we view things through. And so in the United States, we tend to view things through a guilt-based culture. A guilt-based culture would, would have some negative emotions around things like, I did bad. Guilt says, I did bad. Whereas shame is, I am bad. And so a shame-based culture would carry a lot of shame around um, different things that they would have done that would bring shame to not just them, but to their family and to their community. And so this idea of honor and shame is an issue that is common to a lot of different cultures and a lot of different, you know, our individual experiences, we've all experienced that. But because of the location of the world and the kind of community that we're talking about here with ancient Israel, they were a shame-based culture. And um, I, I want to give an example of that. I work in lots of countries where we share the gospel. And a lot of times we have to change the way that we present the gospel. It's the same gospel message, but we present it a little bit differently based on the culture that we're working in. So some of the cultures we work in are a fear-based culture. And so one of the barriers to the gospel is fear because of perhaps uh, witchcraft or some of the tribal religions or... Um, you know, the evil presence that's really kind of a guiding lens for them. In a guilt-based culture, which is the United States, we talk about uh, like the penalty for sin and um, we're all guilty. That That is how we explain the gospel. Whereas in like the fear-based culture, we would explain the gospel in terms of um, Jesus has triumph over evil because of the presence of the Holy Spirit and, and through Jesus's death and resurrection, he defeated the enemy. Whereas in a shame-based culture, um, it's, it's more like you belong because of Jesus. You're part of the family of God because of what Jesus did for you on the cross. And so it's all telling the gospel story about the, the same thing that happened, but we do emphasize different aspects based on the people group that we're talking to because that's what resonates with them. Now, there are elements of, I, I love the fact that I have a, a sense of community and belonging in the family of God that that resonates with me even though i'm in a guilt-based culture i still identify with the shame shame resolution i still identify and i love the fact that we have power over the enemy because of the holy spirit even though those aren't the primary ways that americans would understand that or the lens we would use that is certainly something that's still applicable to all three i'm just saying in general as a culture that's kind of what happens when we visit other countries and how we contextualize the gospel. And so this is a shame-based culture. And and let me just say that shame is powerful. It's a powerful deterrent for a lot of different reasons. And it's also a very heavy emotion for the people that really are living in that environment. And 
if you can imagine, um, one of the cultures we work with, um, it's not a, a country I work with now. It's some it's a place that I used to work with, but this is common for a lot of countries. Um, there was a high prevalence of HIV in that area. And UNOS or UNICEF or one of those uh, organizations went in and had HIV medication available to prevent and treat. And there was one pastor that I was speaking with, and he was telling me about um, this group, this family of, of children that were orphaned because the mom and dad had both died of AIDS. And I, it didn't make sense to me because I knew that there was a heavy presence of this organization. There was this huge campaign for this HIV medication, and it was there. And I said, well, why wouldn't they, Why, like the dad specifically, why wouldn't they go and participate in this program and get the medication they need. And the pastor said to me, it's because of shame. He said, shame is like a curse in our culture and it follows you after death. And so if, if this husband, this father were to admit by going and getting this medication, if he were to admit that he had this disease, it, it would be seen by the rest of the community as a, um, a curse or a, a shame, like maybe he got it from having extramarital sex or whatever, however he got it, which that's not always how they get it, but a lot of times that is how they got it. So the shame of even having it or contracting that in the first place, the shame that would be passed down to the children and to the rest of the family would be worse for them than the pain of losing their father. And I thought, how heavy is that? That shame in their culture over getting and receiving this medication, the shame that would follow him and follow that family would be worse than him just passing away and dying. And we know how difficult it is for a child to lose their, their parent, especially in an environment where there's poverty and the children are completely dependent on the father working in order to have food and, and, or schooling or any of them and any of it. And so think of how heavy that weight of shame must be if they were willing to risk their children being orphaned or out on the street or, or, or going through the, the process of, of losing a parent that was easier than dealing with the shame. That was perspective shifting for me. And so I don't want to skip over that when, when David is saying, do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. There's a reason why he puts shame first. He says, don't let me be put to shame. And then he says, or let my enemies triumph over me. Well, if the enemies triumphed over him, then most likely he would die. And so shame in many cultures is worse than death. I want to point that out because I think in our Western mindset, sometimes we don't quite understand that. In these cultures, these ancient cultures, shame was a tactic that was used to control or to punish or to enforce the control that they had over different people groups. And so there was official shaming or that would have gone through like a legal or maybe a political channel. There was things like public punishment or humiliation. And then it's in some extreme cases, they you know would even be maybe exposed naked and um, shamed. Like I think of even in the New Testament uh, with the woman that was caught in adultery, how she's brought out naked. It, part of that is to shame her because shame was such a powerful tactic that they used for control. And then there was also the informal shape, shaming, which would um, follow people that sometimes were even innocent of doing anything wrong. Like, like the children of that family like that I just mentioned, the children would not have done anything wrong, but they would be carrying the shame of the father. And so when it talks sometimes about the sins of the father or talks about shame, that's kind of the heaviness that's behind those words. And I, and I think sometimes we just skip right over them without recognizing that when the psalmist is crying out for God to demonstrate his power or his deliverance from something as seemingly simple as shame there's a lot of things that are behind those words that um have an impact on how we read them so i i wanted to point that out
Okay, and then down in verse 4, show me your ways, O Lord, teach me your paths. Throughout the scripture, we see Yahweh as the teacher and David the psalmist as the student. And so remember, this is a culture back then, the Jewish culture would have really heavily employed the rabbi as the teacher, the rabbi student relationship. And so when he's saying, show me your ways, Lord, he's kind of acting like Moses did, where um, David is really deeply desiring to know how God works and to understand his purpose and his plan for his life and for his leadership. And I think that is important for us to recognize that as believers, it's possible to know things about what God is doing, um, whether it is salvation or miracles. Um, it's possible to know something about what's God, what God is doing without really knowing God personally or understanding his ways. And so um, I, I think about situations where people might be uh, like even in like some more charismatic circles, which I'm not knocking charismatic circles at all. I'm part of that. Uh, I would consider myself part of that group. But sometimes in charismatic circles, what will happen is, is people will go to a church that has a heavy presence of the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. So I'm talking about gifts of the Spirit. Maybe it's praying in tongues or a prophetic word or very anointed worship, those kinds of things, healing. And, and people will attend those kinds of churches and know about the things of God without having a true relationship with God themselves or a true understanding of how those things work or function. And so what ends up happening is they will know about God, but they won't really know God. And then eventually what happens is those people will really struggle and say, like, I, I don't feel like I hear from, from God. But then you ask them, well, what are you reading God's word? And they're not reading God's word. And the primary way that God speaks to us and through us is with his word. And so there's also a caution there, too, that if you are somebody that is and I, I've had to catch myself on this too. If you are somebody that operates in the prophetic, but yet you're not in the word, there is a, a chance of disobedience or missing that or misunderstanding what God's saying because any prophetic word that God gives will be in line with God's word. So God's not going to give a prophetic word like in a worship service or something that is contrary to what he says in the scriptures. That's not the way it operates. And so that's one of the ways that if you are somebody that has a prophetic gifting, you can keep and make sure that you are in line and you are in check because you have to be in line with the word of God. He, he's not going to contradict himself. That's a sidebar. So, so if the goal is really knowing God personally and understanding how he works and the principles that he uses and the wisdom that, that he talks about and understanding God's wisdom and the way that he works in us and guides us and, and operates, um, what we're seeing here is the psalmist, David, he's, he's giving some principles for knowing and succeeding in God's ways. So in verse four, it says, show me your ways, O Lord, teach me your paths. So first he says, guide me in your truth and teach me for you are my God, my savior, and my hope is in you all day long. So he's saying, guide me. So what, what I think is, is important for us to see is we have to have a sincere desire for God to lead us in the ways that are right according to God's standard of truth and God's standard in his word. Because sometimes what will happen is we will just kind of guess or we will just do what's ever right for our flesh or whatever's right for our, our pocketbook or our uh, circumstances. But really what David is showing us is this example of surrendering those things to God and saying, God, you show me your path. You show me your way. Because sometimes God's path is different than our path. God's path sometimes does not make sense to us. It doesn't make sense in the physical. It might not make sense for the timing. It might not make sense for this situation or the life circumstances that we're in right now. But oftentimes when we surrender to what God is doing, even when it doesn't make sense, we see God's best plan for us because God knows everything. I use this analogy with my children. Um, if I took out, take out a piece of paper. And I put a, a marker dot on the paper. And then I will ask the kids, what do you see? And they say, well, I see a dot on a piece of paper. And then maybe one of my other kids who's a little bit smarter or older will say, well, I see a piece of paper. 
and maybe one of the other kids who's a little bit older and wiser will say, well, I see a table with a piece of paper on it. And then I will say, okay, but God sees the house. And God sees the road that we live on. And God sees the town that we live in. And God sees the state that we live in. It, God's plan and God's picture is so much bigger than our narrow focus and our narrow view. And so sometimes it comes down to a trust issue where we're not just asking God to guide us, but we need to surrender to the things that he is showing us when he does reveal, reveal those things. So the second thing that we learn is in verse 5. Um, guide me in your truth and teach me for you are God my savior my hope is in you all day long we must be willing to place our trust and our hope in God all day long and I think sometimes that's hard because I don't know if you're like me but I will second guess and so sometimes I will get to this place where I will surrender to the thing that I that I God reveals that he's doing and then I'll second guess myself especially in situations that um, like somebody else would look at that situation and they would not fault you for either decision. So, so, you know, sometimes we're faced with decisions where one decision is clearly better than the other, but sometimes we're, ha we're given decisions to make where both options look good and both options would look like completely justified regardless of what you chose. Those sometimes are the hardest decisions to make, but yet what we're saying is, okay, God, show me your ways, teach me your path, guide me, and then help me to rest in that place all day long and not second guess and not take that back. And that's hard to do. I mean, we can only do that through the power of the Holy Spirit because it's impossible for us to do on our own. And then I want to jump down to verse nine. It says, he guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. I, I think this talks about this idea of humbly submitting to God and committing ourselves to godly living. Because in verse 10, it says, all the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful for those who keep the demands of his covenant. Um, understanding that as we commit ourselves to godly living and fearing the Lord, which is this idea of honoring and respecting and recognizing the power and authority that God has in our lives, um, we do that from a, a humble place in our lives. And it's not to brag and say, well, I surrendered my you know, will to God's will. That's defeating the whole point. It's really more of this aspect of, okay, God, I know enough to know that you are no more than I do, and I trust you. And even though I'm afraid or I don't completely understand, I'm going to submit myself to you. And I will say that there is a protective element in that because um, I think sometimes we get afraid to, to do those things because we're afraid to make the wrong decision. But when we are coming with this posture of, okay, God, I trust you. I'm humbly submitting to you. We have to have faith that he will reveal it to us if we are making the wrong decision. He loves us. He, you, he is a good father. He desires for us, especially when we're trying to be obedient to him. He will reveal it to us if we're making the wrong choice. And you know, not only that, I've made a lot of wrong decisions in my life, like bad decisions, and God has redeemed them or uh, made a way. I'll, I'll tell you, there's two different opportunities in my life that have proven to be life-changing. Um, the first, uh, one, one I'm not going to reveal publicly, but the second is I... Um, <laughs> the job that I'm at, Children of the Nations, the, the missions work that I do, uh, I turned that job down at first because it just... It didn't make sense for me in the physical at the time. I was already, I was already involved in a ministry that I loved. That it was really hard for me to make the decision to let go of, and uh, it ended up that COTN is where I'm supposed to be. It's it's um, the role that God has really created for me for me and created me for. Um, but in the beginning, I turned it down, and then they came back and said, "We really think that you're supposed to be part of this team." And through this whole process. Um, even though I made a bad decision at first, God revealed that. And I'm so thankful for his grace in my life. There's been a couple different times where I've I've screwed things up or I've tried to screw things up. Maybe I haven't tried, but I have perhaps not made the right decision. 
And God in his grace is like, okay, come on, think again. And I'm so thankful for that to the point where it, it's freed me up for making decisions now because I recognize that if I'm trying to make the wrong decision, God will protect me from it or God will bring it back around or he will redeem it somehow because he's a good father and that's what he does. And I, and I think about my kids when my kids make a bad decision. And I'm trying to teach them autonomy or teach them independence. And I allow them to make that bad decision. But then I also go back and I prod them or I give them another opportunity or I give them another chance. Or when they have met the consequences of, of that bad decision, I'm there to support them and love them and then point them back towards the right path. And, and we forget that God is a good father. and He does the same thing for us. He's so much better than we are as a parent. And so if that's how we are as parents, then think about how God is as a parent. And, and he's a God of mercy and he's a God of grace. And, and we can't forget that. Okay, let's go down to, well, let me, let me talk about verse 4 through 8. Verse 4 through 8 is really talking about knowing God and knowing his ways. But I don't want us to forget, and we've talked about this a couple different times over the last week or so, week or so that sometimes sin can be a barrier to knowing God's ways. And in order to be in a posture of being able to make that decision and being able to hear his voice clearly, we have to remove the things in our lives that offend God or reject his standards or place any kind of barrier in between us. Because what happens is a sin is is what puts this wall between God and us. That it's, it, I mean, it's the reason why Jesus had to die in the first place, because it's our sin that separates us from God. And it's through Jesus that we are reconciled to God, because Jesus paid the price for our sin. But when we sin, or we are allowing sin to take hold in our lives, or we are living with uh, perpetual sin in our lives, um, and, and sometimes it's not big sins. It's not like, you know, everybody's out there committing adultery, but they might be gossiping. And um, even in the church, I mean, I remember one time I was serving in a church and three of the children's workers who were supposed to be in the classrooms, like, you know, doing children's ministry, were out in the hallway all gossiping about another children's worker. And I, I let it go for a little bit. And then I just kind of stepped in and I said, you know what, guys, God hates gossip. And they were so offended. <laughs> they were so offended by me even saying anything. But yet that's what they were doing. And, and one of them came back later and said, you know what, I needed to be called out like that. And thank you. The other, the other two, they were mad at me. They're probably still mad at me, but I don't care. But my point is, is sometimes it's a slippery slope. And it's not just these big, huge sins. But it is the words that have come out of our mouths, or it's the attitudes of our heart, or it's the way that we respond to somebody. Sometimes those are the things that God is trying to get in check. And if we're not hearing God's voice clearly, then it's time to turn inward. And and we're not, it's not, um, let's blame God for he, he's not speaking. That's not it at all. It's, are we able to listen? And if not, why? What is the barrier? Um, for, there's, there's some people I know that, uh, do not take the Sabbath seriously and they work every single Sunday and then they wonder why they're not hearing from God in their spiritual lives. Well, God has very clearly given this, um, statute that the Sabbath is so important. He, if he himself rested on the seventh day, there's no reason why we can't rest. And, and not that everybody has to have Sunday as their Sabbath. I know some people do it on Saturday or some people do it on Friday. Um, the point is, is taking a day to rest and to refill and to have fellowship with, with the Holy Spirit, with God, with other believers. There's, there's a biblical principle there. And so there's all different things that that's why reading God's word is so important because it reveals God's best plan for our lives and it helps us get to a place where we can hear his voice more clearly and I'm not ignorant I'm not going to say that none of us are ever going to sin ever again that's obviously not it but the hope is that when you do sin that 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 voice of the Holy Spirit that convicts us we will be quick to listen to and quick to surrender to and quick to repent of the things that we're doing that are putting barriers in place The good news, though, is that we don't have to do this alone. Let's look at verse 11. It says, For the sake of your name, O Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. 
So that word that's translated uh, iniquity, a wan in Hebrew, A-W-O-N, it means perversion. Or it could also mean crooked behavior. And it comes from this root, root word that means to twist or to distort. And so it's often used to refer to like a twisting of something that could have been good, but then it's, um, it's twisted and it's suggesting like this idea of wrong motives or selfish purposes. And that term is also used a lot of times to describe the guilt of sin that was done on purpose. So, and then even the punishment that follows it, that's kind of all wrapped up in the, in that idea. And so when it says in verse 11, for the sake of your name, O Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. What David is doing is he's saying, listen, I know that I messed up. Like I, I mean, we know David's story. If you don't know David's story, read David's story. But we all know that there are things or times in our lives where we're weak, where we give in to the flesh, where we do things on purpose that we know is wrong. And God's grace is there, of course, to to forgive us and help us work through that. But we have to come to this place where we ask him to help us through that. And then in verse 12, it says, who then is the man that fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way chosen for him. The main theme of this psalm is how God in his wisdom will guide his followers, his the believers, his, his faithful people. And there's a lot of truth here. Number one, God has a plan for every single person. There's not one person on this planet right now that God does not have a plan for. He has a plan for you. And just like he had a plan for Adam and Abraham and Joseph and, and all of Israel and Jesus, he has a plan for you. God has a definite plan for you. Think about that for a minute. Just as much as God had a plan for Jesus, he has a plan for you. God has a plan for you. The second thing I think that this shows us is that God's plans can be communicated to us in lots of different ways through his word, through, through the Bible, the scriptures, he can use um, different giftings through like dreams or visions or a prophetic word. But the usual way that he guides us and gives us his wisdom is through his word, through the Holy Spirit that's living with, with us. So what that means is as I'm reading through this Psalm, there might be specific verses that God impresses on my heart as relevant for me today. And that might be different than those relevant verses that he uses for you that are going to be relevant for you in your situation today. But that's the beauty of God. That's what it's talking about when, when the word is living and active. It's not that it means different people for different times or different seasons. Um, the word of God is the word of God and it means what it means. But there's different portions that are going to make more of an impact on us depending on where we're at in our lives at the time. And so if I'm in a season of walking in disobedience, then it's going to be more convicting to me than somebody who's not in a season of disobedience. Or if I'm in a season of trusting God and making a decision and fearful of the outcome, um, that's going to mean more to me in this that season versus somebody that's not facing a decision. So all of it will reveal God's nature and character. And so if we're not going through that season right now, the encouragement is, is that eventually we will. It's part of the human experience. It also reveals that we can miss God's plan if we are ignoring or rejecting or even misusing God's word. And so doing any of those things will lead us to make decisions that go against God's plan and God's desire for us. And, you know, depending on your theological background, there are different churches that approach this differently. Um, sometimes what will happen, even in terms of leadership, church leadership, there's sometimes an agenda that is being taught and they will cherry pick different verses and manipulate them to promote their agenda versus going through the scriptures and and reading it for what it says and what it reveals about God's nature and character. There's always a danger when we're cherry picking verses. That's not to say that we're, we don't cross reference. Of course we do. But I would be very careful and I would read the word for yourself if you're in a situation that maybe doesn't feel right or things don't cut quite add up or there's more of that person's agenda versus God's word in, in that in that teaching. Um, I think that's the danger of the law. A lot of the fallen pastors that we've 
seen in the last year. And I don't want to, I'm not knocking the local church. Most local churches are fine. They're, they're Bible believing and they're a huge blessing. But we as believers have gotten a bad rap over the last couple of years because what's been happening, especially during the pandemic, when the foundation that these people are standing on has not been firm the celebrity kind of pastor that is promoting a platform or an agenda, we've seen them fall. And, and that, that's a lot of that is, is why, because they're not reading God's word and teaching God's word as it's meant to be taught. Instead, they're using it to uh, promote their agenda or their platform. And uh, there's a danger. There's that that's obviously something that scripture warns against. And then also the, the fourth element is righteousness. And this is really this idea of doing what God says is right and doing it for the right reasons and staying in a right relationship with God. And so that's the most important thing. If we are seeking God's guidance, especially on a decision or for his plan for our lives, because God wants to guide us in paths of righteousness. And so don't miss that part. God wants to guide us in paths of righteousness. If we are asking God for a decision on uh, which guy we should sleep with tomorrow, well, obviously he's not going to give us insight on that because you shouldn't be doing that. But, but the guidance comes when we are sincerely seeking him for a righteous path. And um, I think of situations in my life where I've had to make a decision between maybe two really good opportunities and both of them would be good opportunities. And I really needed God's guidance to determine which one was the best opportunity. It's those kinds of things. And both of them were ministry opportunities. So it's not like I was trying to work at Kmart or Walmart. I mean, I'm talking about these were both ministry opportunities, both making an impact just in different areas of ministry. And God's guidance was amazing in those situations. And so I think of situations like that where where we have to remember God wants to guide us, but he's only going to do that if we're pursuing righteousness. And if we don't understand what righteousness is, that's why we need to understand and read through God's word. There is a privilege in knowing him. 25 verse 14. This is the last one. Then we're going to finish up. The Lord confides in those who fear him and he makes his covenant known to them. There's a privilege of knowing God and enjoying this close personal relationship with him. And it is reserved for those who fear him and are pursuing him. Um, And it's not to say that God can't speak in an audible voice to somebody that's not following him. But a lot of times what happens is, is um, we talked about the, the book of Elijah in the past. There isn't this, most of the time, this big, loud, booming, audible voice that tells us which direction to go. In the book of Elijah, in the story of Elijah, I think it's Second Kings, it talks about how Elijah was hiding in a cave. And as he was hiding in the cave, it was time... He, he knew it was time to start coming out of the cave and there was a great wind and the voice of the Lord was not in the wind and there was a great fire and the voice of the Lord was not in the fire. The voice of the Lord was in the silent, still whisper. It was a still, small voice. And that still, small voice is, is the way that God speaks to us 99% of the time. And so if we are not quieting our hearts to listen for his voice, we're going to miss it. It's easy to miss. But my friend, he wants you to hear his voice. And I have to believe that if you are listening to the Hearing Jesus podcast, you want to hear his voice. And so as I read through Psalm 25 again, with some of those insights, think about that as I read through this and meditate that on that today. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. In you, I trust, O my God. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame, but they will be put to shame who are treacherous without excuse. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Remember, O Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you are good, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful for those who keep the demands of his covenant. For the sake of your name, O Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. 
Who then is the man that fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way chosen for him. He will spend his days in prosperity, and his descendants will inherit the land. The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. My eyes are ever on the Lord, for only he will release my feet from the snare. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart have multiplied. Free me from my anguish. Look upon my affliction and my distress, and take away all my sins. See how my enemies have increased and how fiercely they hate me. Guard my life and rescue me. Let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness protect me, because my hope is in you. Redeem Israel, O God, from all their troubles. God, we thank you that you are a God of righteousness that wants to reveal yourself to us in paths of righteousness. God, I thank you that there is the ability to hear your voice. But Lord, I pray that if there are things that are in our hearts or our minds or our lives, hidden sins even, that are barriers to hearing your voice, God, would you reveal those to us? Would you reveal them and help us to surrender them to you and to walk in obedience according to your plan for our lives? Lord, I thank you that you long to have this close relationship with us and you empower us through the gift of the Holy Spirit to do that. So, Lord, I pray for a special blessing for my friends today, that you would continue to reveal yourself through the Holy Spirit to them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, friends, real quick before we go, there's a couple things I want to tell you about. The first is that we have a Christian Lubin's daily Bible study group on Facebook. If you want to join that, it's completely free, and it's just a place to ask questions or to ask for prayer or get some accountability and just really build some community. And then also, we have a free newsletter that goes out every Monday that includes journaling prompts around the devotional content. So if you're using this as part of your morning devotions, that resource, I think, will be helpful because the journaling aspect or the the journal prompts are a way to help get you the information from your head into your heart. So I pray both of those bless you. Hey friends, if this podcast helped encourage, empower, or equip you for God's call on your life, I would love it if you would head over to Apple Podcasts and leave me a review. That's the number one way you can support my show. You can also join our free Facebook community or Instagram page where I share inspirational tips, resources, and prayer throughout the week. Hey, I want you to know I'm praying for you this week. Know that you are loved, you are cherished, and you are His. Why are Christians always so serious? I'm Barnabas Piper of the Happy Rant Podcast, where we take Jesus seriously, but not too much else. Subscribe at lifeaudio.com.